The most important deficit that you're creating is your environmental deficit. We are engaged in environmental degradation through global warming. It's unambiguous. Our future generations are going to have to pay that debt in one way or another. That's a real debt. The financial debt is just some Australians owing money to other Australians. But this debt to the environment, we can't escape that. One for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Treasurer. The treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in you know, a banana republic. Just follow the money. G'day, and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains economics, politics and policy in plain English. I'm your host, Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. Freedom is a word that's loaded with symbolism, particularly in the United States, where it's been co-opted by the right of politics to imply free market capitalism, an unrestricted right to firearms, and individual liberty are important above all else. We have a Second Amendment because we understand in this country that there are some things, inalienable rights, that you cannot justly take away from a free and equal human being. First of all, I support the Second Amendment. I understand and respect the tradition of gun ownership. It goes back to the founding of our country. If he didn't have a gun, instead of having 26 dead, he would have had hundreds more dead. So that's the way I feel about it. And are you not going to help? Tyrants disarm the people they intend to oppress. Those are the facts. But freedom isn't that simple. Professor Joseph Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize winning economist and the man who coined the term the 1%. He's a professor at Columbia University Business School, a former chief economist at the World Bank and a best-selling author. And his latest book is The Road to Freedom, Economics and the Good Society. It's a powerful re-evaluation of democracy and economics. And in the book, he asks what happens when one person's freedom comes at the expense of another's and what kind of economy promotes a genuinely good, just and free society. I got to speak with Professor Stiglitz in our Canberra studios this week for the latest edition of Australia's Biggest Book Club. And Professor Stiglitz has been touring Australia as a guest of the Australia Institute as part of our 30th anniversary celebrations, where we're bringing some of the world's best and biggest thinkers to Australia. We discussed inequality and the rise of Donald Trump, the devastating impact of free markets on our climate, and some policy ideas for Australia. I hope you enjoy. I want to begin with the title, I guess, The Road to Freedom. For decades, it really does seem like freedom, the idea of freedom is really the one pushed by the right, and particularly in America and American politics, a kind of flag-waving, gun-toting kind of version of, of freedom and individual liberty above all else. Tell us about your version of freedom, where you ask the question, freedom for who? Who are we, whose freedom are we talking about? Uh, precisely. And what do you mean by freedom? Uh, it's you know, a concept I call freedom to do things. Somebody who's on the point of st- starvation uh, doesn't really have freedom. He has to do what he does to survive. Yeah. And a very important idea that I have in the context of the American debate is this notion that one person's freedom can impinge on that of another. Or as I put it, you know, one person's freedom is another person's unfreedom. Uh, Your right to carry a gun, an AK-47, has resulted in the loss of lives of other people. And the freedom to live has to be weighed against the freedom to carry an AK-47. And my view is most reasonable societies would balance those and say, well, you really don't need to carry around an AK-47 yeah. everywhere, and the freedom to live is more important. In that particular case, there's another freedom that uh, one of our great presidents, FDR, talked about, which is freedom from fear. Uh, today, because so many people are carrying around ak 47s we have a mass murder virtually every day. Little school children, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, have to be trained to know what to do when a gunman comes into their classroom. So 
they live in fear. The parents live in fear that their children might not come home. Yeah. And so even though you might say it's only one a day mass murder <laughs> across a big country, that one a day it instills a kind of national fear. So that's an example of balancing. Uh, Isaiah Berlin, one of the great Oxford uh, philosophers, put it, uh, freedom for the wolves as meant death for the sheep. <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, an amazing way to put it, I think, because so much of what we hear, particularly from, I guess, the orthodoxy in economics, at least the the dominant role that neoliberalism has played, is is really this idea, yeah, that, you know, what's good for companies is kind of what's best for the country. But we know from the results of privatization and all of those kinds of other things, so often it feels like death for the sheep more than uh, freedom for anyone. So I'm curious about, you know, a lot of your life's work is around neoliberalism and the inequality it's produced. How much do you think that can go to explaining the emergence of politicians like Donald Trump, for example, and the far-right populist figures? I think it's played a very important role. Uh, the way I like to think about it, it created a fertile field. And over history, we've seen that there's a large supply of demagogues ready to take advantage of that fertile field. You can't predict when it's going to happen. You can't predict the precise nature of the demagogue. Um, I think America was unlucky to have a demagogue as bad as Donald Trump, and in some way as good, as good in the sense that he really has been able to take advantage of the discontent. Um, and it's sort of a, ironic in a way that you have this inequality in society, partly caused by uh, market power, partly caused by a lack of regulation. So you have poor corporations exploiting other individuals, exploiting the environment. And Donald Trump is an exploiter. So you have one of the exploiters taking advantage of the neoliberal framework of the right to exploit over the rights of the exploited and becoming very popular mm. and saying the system is rigged. Yes, it's rigged in favor of people like you who've taken advantage of others, created a, a private university, Trump University, that really took advantage of people's aspirations to get ahead. I think it's very clear to us, uh, I don't speak for the bank, but it's very clear to Australians more broadly, uh, that the economy is barely growing. Looks like it's going to be a very tough year for Australians and for the Albanese government this year. If it turns out, for example, that inflation starts to go up again or it's much stickier than we think, we're not getting it down, then we won't hesitate to move and raise interest rates again. I want to kind of talk now because we've got the US election coming up, obviously, but here in Australia, we've also got a federal election coming probably before May next year. So it could be pretty close as well. We're also, I think, really seeing the problems associated with inflation post-pandemic, cost of living is a really big economic issue here in Australia, and housing in particular has become a red-hot issue in politics, but more importantly in people's everyday lives. What are some of the ways that you think the Australian government, uh, what are some of the things that they could be doing to alleviate the cost of living and have a, a good economic story to, to sell to the public? coming up to a next, the next election? Uh, well, first, let me relate your question to the broader title of my uh, book, which Please. is The Road to Freedom. It's a riff off of a famous book by Friedrich Hayek, who is one of the uh, founders of the extreme right wing. Mm. And he wrote a book called The Road to Serfdom. He wrote that book in 1944 in the context of the world recovering from the Great Depression, where we had discovered, Keynes and others, that you could prevent a Great Depression. Government can do things. The market doesn't always work, and government can come in and make sure you don't go into a depression. 
And it can protect people against uh, insecurity, against uh, old age insecurity. Uh, it can make investments on pe- uh, young people so they can live up to their potential. And Hayek worried that this kind of government activity would actually lead to the road to serfdom, would re- lead to fascism. And I think what we've learned in the subsequent uh, more, you know, 75 years is that the road to fascism is paved by governments doing too little, not too much. Mm. That a country like the United States, where we've done too little about inequality, too little about market power, that you have an extreme right-wing populist like Donald Trump. So you think that's not a coincidence, basically? I, I think it's not a coincidence, <laughs> to go back to your question. Yeah. So, so now you're asking a specific question, what can government do mm. to uh, address the specific question that we're facing today? And I think it's important to put it in context. This inflation is a particularity of the pandemic, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. It's a moment and we're recovering from it fairly rapidly. And the question is, uh, could the government do more? And is the RBA here in Australia doing the right thing? Whenever you have a problem, a disease, a doctor, we, I think sometimes think of economists, uh, good economists being like doctors, you diagnose, you see what the problem is. You need to have the cure matched with the disease. Yep. Um, if you were a doctor and somebody came in and you set a fever, and for all fevers you did exactly the same thing, that would be bad medicine. Uh, you know, you can come in with a fever and there can be many different causes mm. of that fever. And the same thing about inflation. Sometimes inflation is caused by excess spending. We say excess aggregate demand, demand greater than the supply. That's not the cause of this inflation. Uh, in fact, you know, growth has slowed down a little bit. And, you know, there's some worry about not enough growth. Yeah, which, in Australia, yeah. I, I, and you can't say it's excess demand <laughs> that, that's causing the problem and simultaneously say there's a lack of demand. I mean, <laughs> this incoherent argument that I hear in Australia is a little bit mind boggling. Mm. So you have to look at what is the nature of the problem. Uh, you know, I've done that very carefully for the United States and there are similar patterns globally. This is supply side interruptions, demand shifts caused by the pandemic, caused by the war in Ukraine. It's unambiguous. In the United States, uh, the first burst of inflation had to do with automobiles. It was uh, about one third of the increase in the cost of living in that one period. Um, What was the problem? A shortage of chips. Another important source of inflation uh, was, of course, was oil and uh, food uh, because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, And then another important is housing. Mm. Now, you start thinking about these causes, these particular causes, and you ask, is the policy of the RBA or the Federal Reserve raising interest rates addressing the disease? You ask, does raising interest rates create more oil? Does it create more food? Does it create more chips? Mm. Does it create more houses? I'm spotting a pattern here. (laughs) And the answer is obviously no, but it's worse than that. Let me emphasize, it's worse than that because it makes the problem worse. Part of the problem was supply-side interruptions. Supply-side interruptions need more investment. Part of the problem was housing shortages. Higher interest rates makes it more difficult to make the investments you need to alleviate the shortage of housing. So the RBA policy and the Federal Reserve policy has exacerbated inflation. It's actually made, you know, it's sort of like medieval bloodletting. <laughs> you know, it made the person's health worse. It didn't make it better. So in my mind, they misdiagnosed 
the disease. Mm. And then they gave just the opposite of the right medicine. Now, the question you asked is, what were other things the government could do? And there are actually lots of things the government could do. For instance, uh, in the United States, there were some people that thought we had a labor shortage. Uh, it was a debate about what was going on in the labor market. But if you thought that there was a labor shortage, why not get more women into the labor force? Easy way of doing that, especially in America, we don't have childcare. Mm. We don't have pre-K. And it would be good for the children and good for the economy. It would be good for our future economic growth. And there's clear evidence that pre-K has positive effects on learning. Mm. So that would be a prescription that would be good for the economy now and good for the economy in the long run. And remember, inflation is just a short-run phenomenon that we're having because of this you know, episode that we've been through. Mm. But it is a good thing as you try to address that specific problem they do things that are good for the long run. Yeah. They're good medicines. And that's what we should have done. Now, in Australia, one of the issues is housing. And as I say, raising interest rates <laughs> is the wrong medicine. <laughs> in the context of housing, one of the things that should be clear, there needs to be more finance. When you think about finance, it actually goes to the mortgages. You have a very bad mortgage system here. I don't want to insult Australia, <laughs> but... I don't think you'd find much disagreement. <laughs> um, and very different from that of the United States, where when the RBA raises interest rates, everybody's uh, housing cost goes up immediately. Mm. Um, it really puts the burden of adjustment to a mistaken view of the macro economy on ordinary Australians. It makes no sense mm. in contrast with what we have in the United States, which is fixed rate mortgages. But the real issue here is, can you get money to ordinary Australians at a lower cost? And I think the answer is uh, very clear. Yes, you can. The government should set up a public option. And a public option would be something like the following. If you paid taxes for five years, that gives you the right to a mortgage related to your proven income mm -hmm. and the value of the house, which the government has good statistics on transactions, so they know the value of the house. Mm -hmm. And um, the mortgage should be a fixed payment mortgage, so you don't have that kind of vicissitudes that Australians face today. Yep. So you can design a good, be, much better mortgage that gives people more homeowner security. It's really important. Mm. And the government can play a very important role mm. there. There are three things. Let me just mention very quickly. No, please. I mean, housing is probably one of the number one issue, or the number one issue on people's minds. Uh, it's been getting kind of worse and worse, not better, despite <laughs> all attempts to fix it. So I think people would love to hear. So- Another thing, uh, the inflation more generally that Australia and the United States faces is caused by market power. I mean, it's not the only cause, but it's a major contributor. Uh, markets have gone up. Markets have gone up. We've done a study in the U.S. More in industries with more market power. And the supply side interruptions have provided a context in which firms can more easily exercise that market power. There's no doubt that market power has played a, an important role in this inflation. That's also true in the housing market. You know, whenever you see large profits, it's a strong symptom of market power. Because if you believe in competitive economies, what we tell our students in basic courses, competition drives profits down to normal levels. Mm. When you see billionaires or multimillionaires in real estate, that says something is going on that is counter to this competitive model. 
And there's market power in the construction industry, market power in development. There's a lot of rank seeking having to do sometimes with zoning. Mm. Uh, there are many dimensions to this. It's a complex area, but what is clear is there's lots of ranks. Mm. So that says there ought to be a government inquiry into competition in the building industry and try to make that sector more competitive. Yep. And that would bring down prices. So that's the second thing. Third is the problem I see in many countries is government doing too little rather than too much. And one of the things that successful governments have done has been to take an active role in housing because markets don't work. And it has to do with this market power I talked about before, um, a whole variety of reasons why markets often don't work. And countries like Singapore and, and in cities like Vienna, government has taken a very large role in supply of housing, and those cities are working. And housing costs, housing has become affordable. Mm. So there is an alternative model where government doing a little bit more can bring down the cost of housing. And finally, is, uh, is tax policy. <laughs> Your tax policy uh, has contributed to, uh, you might call it, housing hoarding. I want to talk about tax. And again, coming back to your book and the idea that tax is always a burden, something that we're burdened with, rather than something that brings in revenue that we can spend in ways that can improve society for everyone. I mean, housing is one idea there. But how much do we need to change the way that we think about tax and the ways that better tax policy can help us achieve a better society, a good society? I think taxes uh, are nothing more than the uh, what we pay for having a civilized society. Uh, I forget uh, one of our famous uh, Supreme Court justices said something uh, along that th those lines. We know now how to raise revenue in ways that actually can improve the economy and at the very least don't distort the economy very much. And let me give you some examples. In terms of improving the economy, a tax on carbon, greenhouse gas emissions, discourages people from polluting. So you raise revenue and you discourage bad behavior. A financial transaction tax is a tax that discourages speculative activity, that causes volatility in markets, that causes macroeconomic fluctuations. So it's an example of a tax that makes the economy more stable and raises revenue. So those are examples of taxes that correct market failures and raise revenue. A second category of revenue raising is those that don't distort. And here, the most important example is land and natural resource tax. If you tax land, Australian land, you know, land value, the land in Australia is not going to get mad at you and say, we're going to go off and join another country. <laughs> it's there. And the same thing, your iron ore isn't going to say, we're really mad at you about taxing iron ore. We're going to leave and we're going to go to another country. Now, of course, you have to be able to efficiently develop those natural resources. But doing that doesn't mean you have to give the companies who are the mining companies Billions and billions and billions of profits. But we love to do that here in Australia. <laughs> I, I, it, it's one of the mysteries. <laughs> when I come down here, and this is, you know, I come down here quite often, uh, you keep doing it. <laughs> uh, and it makes no sense. They would willingly take and develop your natural resources for a fraction. You know, they're making billions and billions. They would be doing, willing to do it for just billions. <laughs> and, you know, uh, as I say, uh, of course, they're going to tell you 
that if you don't give them billions and billions, they'll just walk away. But they would say that, wouldn't they? <laughs> they, they, they want more. 20th century, 21st century capitalism encourages people to be selfish. Yeah. But remember, these companies, even the Australian companies, are global companies that are not owned by Australians. And so you're subsidizing, say, Americans, <laughs> rich Americans. So I don't understand why you would want to subsidize rich Americans. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting policy, I would like say, but it doesn't even make sense in terms of what we would call the political economy of Australia. Yeah. Why would you want to subsidize rich Americans? Look, you've stumped me with that one because it's not clear to me either. And, um, you know, I think it really is important to draw attention to the fact that, you know, it's not a decision that we have to keep making. We can change it. And I guess to come back to your point that you were making, for example, about things like childcare earlier, last night on Q&A, you were kind of making this point around gas and, you know, the fact that we give a lot of it away royalty free, for example. Um, and the the line that we always hear back is, of course, well, it creates jobs and it creates investment and that kind of thing, but it's actually a very small employer compared to something like childcare. If we if we made childcare free, that would not only let women go into the workforce, but there'd be way more jobs in those service type industries. Exactly. I mean, economics is about the allocation of scarce resources. Money is scarce. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we <laughs> wish there were more mana from heaven, and but but it's scarce, and you have to say what way is the best way of spending that money for Australia today, best for Australia in the future? Well, it's very clear that if you want to create more jobs, giving a subsidy to mining companies is not the best way of creating jobs. Yeah. But I would be much more critical than that. The future well-being prosperity of Australia depends on innovation, on the productivity of your labor force. Your gas industry is at most a 20-year, 30-year industry. The world is moving towards net neutrality by 2050. Yeah. There's a commitment to that. So that's an industry that's going to be phased out. Do you want to invest all that in an industry that is dying? Mm. Or would you rather do that in something that's growing? Your uh, research, uh, your universities, uh, people that enhance the capabilities of your citizens and their ability to be innovative and higher standards of living. Mm. Does mining lead to longer longevity, a better standard of living? No, it has just the opposite effect. Yeah. So... If you think about where you want to spend those scarce dollars, do you want to subsidize mines or gas, or do you want to subsidize things that, that really matter? Tonight, I announce that the budget is back in the black and Australia is back on track. Yeah. What we've seen is uh, eight years of deficit from this government, eight years of historically a uh, high debt. We will come back to surplus in 2012-13 because we have put in place very strict fiscal discipline. Well, I mean, we're all aware of the history. Um, we're all aware of the reasons for that. Uh, my focus really is to try and get in the budget in as good a nick as we can. Just sticking again, I guess, with how we can apply some of the lessons from the book to the Australian context, another kind of economic orthodoxy that we have here is always about, always about balanced budgets, essentially. And there's been a lot of calls recently, for example, to rein in spending because we've got high, higher debts and deficit, um, thanks to the spending that we did in the pandemic, which was obviously needed. But it always comes back to this idea that Australia has to have like this idea that we always need a budget surplus. I mean, is there anything in economics that says that's the way to the way to do things or that this now is the time to rein in government spending? Well, uh, no firm would ever look at the world through those lenses. Uh, you take a firm, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, successful firm, it borrows or it gets equity investment so it can make investment. You look at a firm's balance sheet, and I've argued you always ought to look at a country's balance sheet. So if you borrow to make investments, like you borrow money to build more housing, you have a liability on one side of the balance sheet, you have an asset on the other. And that means if there's a scarcity of housing, your net worth has gone up. So that's a good thing. If you borrow in order to make investments in people, education, again, your balance sheet has gone up if you correctly measure your assets. Now, on the other hand, if you give away your natural gas or even sell it at below market value, and then you don't reinvest the proceeds, then you're poor because your assets below the ground are diminished and there's nothing compensating in terms of assets above the ground. So actually, your policy of giving away your natural resources is making you poor and you ought to take a comprehensive view of your country's balance sheet. Another example of this, the most important deficit that you're creating is your environmental deficit. And this is a global thing, but mm. we are engaged in environmental degradation through global warming. It's unambiguous. Our future generations are going to have to pay that debt in one way or another. That's a real debt. The financial debt is just some Australians owing money to other Australians. But this debt to the environment, we can't escape that. Mm. There's one more perspective that I want to uh, put across. There is a concept that economists use called the balanced budget multiplier. If somehow you got in your mind this wrong view that you had to have a balanced financial budget, mm. you know, you don't look at the assets, you don't, you just say, I want, I want to make sure that if I spend more, I have more taxes. You can do that. I mean, I, I talked about all the ways you could raise revenues mm. that are actually good for the economy or at least not bad for the economy. <laughs> yeah. If you raise revenue in that way and spend it, that's called a balanced budget, it actually stimulates the economy. And if you spend the money on things that are assets, you make the country wealthier. And so that's what you should be thinking about. So instead of giving away your natural resources, instead of undertaxing your natural resources, raise the taxes on them, charge royalties, that will give you more revenue, and then spend it more on housing mm. or on universities or on infrastructure. That will make Australia wealthier. You talked there about environmental degradation, and obviously Australia is a massive exporter of fossil fuels. And I guess I want to reflect on uh, one of your Nobel Prizes is for the IPCC Intergovernmental Report on, on Climate Change. It is a huge issue here in Australia. We're already feeling the impacts of it. Everywhere. Yeah, everywhere is, and much sooner, I think, than than most people had anticipated. We haven't had a huge amount of luck here in Australia, for example, putting a price on carbon. Uh, so at the moment, polluters are essentially polluting for free while inflicting all this kind of damage. Is there a role for regulation to play here or do you think regulation will come, start to come in more to managing these kinds of problems where we've seen great market failures? Well, I think there's a very big role of regulation. Sometimes we underestimate that regulation can be very simple relative to actually making uh, market work, making a, a, a carbon market work. Um, I actually think you need both, but uh, we estimate, underestimate the efficacy of regulation. There are some regulations that are really simple, don't, don't cost anything to enforce, like no new coal-fired electric generating plants. You know, cost zero to enforce <laughs> it. You know, yeah. you, you can't get away with constructing one and say, you know, 
Uh, Oops. <laughs> Oops. We, we made a mistake. We thought we were constructing uh, a renewable. You know, that, that just doesn't happen. Stoplights are easy regulation and makes our economy, our, our uh, transportation system work better. Uh, if you go through the various sources of uh, pollution, a relatively small set of regulations would get at about three-fourths of the greenhouse gases. Mm. And that, in turn, would put less of a burden on carbon pricing and would mean that you could get to net neutrality by 2050 with a smaller tax. And that would be a package that I think would be more socially acceptable and less uh, redistributive consequences and very efficient. That's where we'll leave this episode of Follow the Money. A huge thank you to Professor Joe Stiglitz for joining us. This discussion was recorded on Tuesday the 13th of August and things may have changed since recording. If you want to join future editions of Australia's Biggest Book Club or explore our research, you can find all the details at australiainstitute.org.au. And we would love to hear your thoughts on today's discussion. You can reach out to us via email at podcasts at australiainstitute.org.au or you can find us on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. Our theme music is by Jonathan McBeat from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ebony Bennett. Thanks for listening. Oh, oh, oh.